Okay, hello. Um, can everyone hear me? All right, so um, as usual, before I start, I should ask if there's any questions about the course or assignments or anything. I'm sorry, I still haven't announced office hours. Um, uh, but I know the rest of my schedule now, so I should be able to do that. Maybe tonight I'll announce what my office hours will be. Um, okay. <laughs> Surprise guest visit from a cat. Um, <laughs> all right. So I'll start talking about Hobbes then. Um, so this reading is basically about, oh, and let me get rid of the table refrigerator magnet as well. <laughs> um, so this reading is basically about the origin of injustice. Let me erase this stuff. Now, um, not about the origin of injustice in the sense of like what makes people be unjust, but in the sense of what makes there be such a thing as injustice, right? Or as we might say, since when is injustice even a thing, <laughs> right? Um, um, and it sets up based on, right, so this is still part of book one on man. It sets up based on um, human nature or what has been described as human nature in the first part of book one. It sets up the fact that a commonwealth will be necessary if there is going to be such a thing as injustice. Um, it doesn't explain how we can possibly have a commonwealth. That's, that will be the reading from the beginning of book two next time. But it, talks, but it explains why a commonwealth will be needed. Um, and there's two parts to the explanation. So the first part is um, about the state of nature. Or, Sorry to interrupt you, Professor. Um, yes. If you could repeat, and now I'm forgetting what it was, but it was like Commonwealth and why oh. it did. Does that make sense? It was. It was. What I was saying is that um, here in the second part of Book One, Hobbes explains why a Commonwealth will be needed for. I mean, I'm saying it in a kind of deliberately paradoxical way but you'll see why in a second but that I mean why there has to be a commonwealth for there to be a difference between just and unjust actions okay whereas the beginning of book two is going to explain how we could actually have a commonwealth like how they can start um, so so in this part we're not we're not show we're showing that we need it but we're not showing that it's possible basically um, whereas in book two, start at the beginning of book two, he's going to explain how it's possible. Does that make sense? It, it makes sense. Um, so a commonwealth is needed, essentially, is like yeah. just what I wanted to confirm. Yes. Yeah. A commonwealth is needed for there to be a distinction between just and unjust. Okay. So... I mark down that it's like as a marker of one thing to another. Marker of one thing to another? Again, never mind. Just erase that. That's me trying to understand it in my own terms. But, uh, <laughs> that's that's okay. Wait. No, I'm just trying to understand what your terms are. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, Excuse me, Professor. Yeah. If this makes sense, would it be like the commonwealth is that which establishes the norms of what is considered just or unjust? Well, uh, I mean, 
um, so a norm is like a pattern or a rule that you compare something to to see if it's right or not. Or I guess I should say maybe just the law. Yeah. Well, the I mean, um, no, not exactly. The Commonwealth is what makes those the law. Um, capable of explaining our actions, <laughs> right? Because the, what I was about to write down here is, I mean, uh, commonwealths do make laws, the civil law, but there's also these, the law of nature. Um, the law of nature is, um, so, The state of nature is the state in which we have the right of nature. And so the first part of the explanation is to explain why the right of nature is so extensive that we can't violate it. And therefore, there's no distinction between just and unjust in the state of nature. But the laws of nature are supposed to be rules that reason prescribes for creating an artificial distinction between just and unjust. Um, so the laws of nature are things that, um, uh, if we're reasonable, we'll desire to see followed and not violated. So that's not created by the commonwealth, right? That's created by reason based on human nature. But it's, um, um, but as we'll see in the state of nature, in the state of nature, the laws of nature basically don't do anything except make me wish that they were enforceable. In the commonwealth, the, 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 laws of nature become binding. Um, I, you know, so this is all in response to the question whether the Commonwealth creates the norms. So in, in some sense, it doesn't create the norm. The norm is a norm of reason. But, um, but, uh, um, It's reasonable to desire a commonwealth because without a commonwealth, the, the norm of reason is powerless. All right. I mean, I, th I hope this will become clearer as I go through some of the details here. So maybe I hope that will do for now. But if you still have more questions, um, feel free to interrupt me as I go. <laughs> so, um, Right, so I'm going to begin by talking about the state of nature and the right of nature. Um, so, you know, maybe I shouldn't have raised right of nature. So Hobbes takes the English word right to be a translation of the Latin word use which is the same word that is in justice. Um, so injustice is going to be the opposite of right. That is, to act unjustly is to do what you don't have a right to do. Or to take unjustly is to take what you don't have the right to, to take. Um, so what is a right? Well, so Hobbes, you know, as usual, is careful to define what a right is. This is on page 79. Nine, uh, chapter fourteen. Oops. Well, oh, this is frozen. So I don't know. Yeah. Okay. 
There we go. Chapter 14. Um, wait. Right. Oh, yeah. Chapter 14, Section 3. Right consisteth in liberty to do or to forbear. And liberty, he defined right up above, by liberty is understood, according to the proper signification of the word, the absence of external impediments. So, um, In other words, um, since a right is a liberty to do or for to do or forbear, that is to do or not do, and liberty is absence of external impediments, I have a right to do something when there's no external impediment to my doing it. Now, of um, of course, we can take impediments uh, literally. And sometimes, and including at the beginning of chapter 14, when Hobbes discusses right and liberty, he does take impediment literally. So an impediment would be like a chain, right? So, you know, um, I'm not at liberty to do something means I can't do it because it's a chain. That's an impediment that's keeping me from doing it. Um, And in that sense of right, and this is kind of a tricky move, and it's a typical trippy, tricky move on Hobbes's part. In that sense of right, I can't possibly do something I don't have a right to do, ever. Right? Because um, if I don't have a right to do it, that means there's an impediment to my doing it. So I can't do it. <laughs> um, but um, only much later on, in chapter 21, actually, does he make a clear distinction between two different types of liberty. So, so right equals liberty to do or forbear. And liberty means no external impediment. Right? It's, it's no external impediment, because if the impediment is internal, Locke says, we don't say I lock, lack the liberty, we say I lack the power. Right? There's, there's something in, inside me that makes me not able to do it, and we say I don't have the power. But if it's an external impediment, we say I don't have the liberty. So in chapter 21, he makes the distinction between two different types of impediments. There's literal impediments like chains and walls, and then there's um, artificial impediments, as he calls them, or artificial chains. Um, and these artificial chains consist in um, a reliable threat of retribution if I do something. So I don't know where to write this here, but... Um, chains, or you might call them natural chains, but of course not in the sense that they grew naturally, but in the sense that uh, they're made out of, the way they restrain me is natural, I guess I would say. They restrain me due to the natural actions of bodies, um, as opposed to, um, well, you might call them, you know, maybe I shouldn't say that, but um, artificial impediments that that consist again in the fact that 
I know that if I do some, something, there's a reliable threat that I will be punished. So when he talks about this in chapter 21, Hobbes says that these kind of artificial chains are not difficult to break, but they're dangerous to break. Right, so in the first sense of liberty, I'm perfectly at liberty to um, go against what these, to, to break through these artificial impediments at any time. Nothing's stopping me from doing it. But um, um, if I desire my own preservation, um, uh, I don't want to go against these artificial chains because I reckon that it will be dangerous to do it. So the basic thesis about the state of nature is that in the state of nature there are no there are none of these artificial impediments. Um, now um, what does that mean? Well, oh, can I give an example of an artificial impediment, someone asks. Well, the, ex the, the main example is going to be a civil law. Um, or I guess any law of the commonwealth. So, right, the, a law is a rule that's announced according to which if someone violates it, the whole power of the commonwealth will be brought against them to punish them. Now, I mean, of course, it's not absolutely certain that you'll be punished if you violate the law. You might get away with it. Um, but uh, it has to be reliable enough that it um, will make me not want to violate it, basically. So that's an example of an artificial impediment. Um, I can also, within a commonwealth, make my own artificial impediments by, by entering into a private contract with someone. Um, I can do that in the state of nature too, but in the state of nature, the impediment doesn't work because there's no one to enforce it. So I'll, I'll talk about that later, but are those examples good enough? So like the contract one, right, the artificial impediment is that, um, again, in the literal sense, I'm free to break the contract. I'm free to take the payment and not deliver the goods or whatever. But um, um, within a civil society where contracts are enforceable, I don't want to break the contract because there's a reliable threat that I'll be... Um, um, punished for breaking it. Okay, so the so again the basic thesis is that in the state of nature no one, I mean he says no man, but from things he says later, I think um, it's pretty clear that this also includes women. Um, no man has any more right than another because there are no artificial chains. Why are there no artificial chains? So if you look in chapter 13, paragraph 1 on page 74, um, By the way, I'm never sure if this thing where I show the book is really helpful or not, but I was told in previous quarters that people did find it helpful. So uh, if you don't, you might want to let me know. Um, this is why there's no artificial change in the state of nature. Nath nature has made men so equal in the faculties of body and mind as that, though there be found one more sometimes, Sorry, I'm having trouble. I only read it up here. One man sometimes manifestly stronger in body or of quicker mind than another, yet when all is reckoned together, the difference between man and man is not so considerable as that one man can thereupon claim to himself any benefit to which another may not pretend as well as he. 
So, so, so far we don't quite understand what, I mean, this could, this, that first sentence could be interpreted in a number of different ways, depending on what you think is necessary to pretend, um, to claim a benefit. But he makes it clear in the second sentence what it means. For as to strength of body, the weakest has strength enough to kill the strongest, either by secret machination or by confederacy with others that are in the same danger with himself. And he goes on to say something similar. He says it's even more true of mental ability, actually. So the point is that um, there's no um, reliable threat that other people will punish me for going against their claim because in a state of nature, no one is in a position to be sure they would win in a fight. Right? So someone has something I want. And the question is, do I have a right to it? So the question of whether I have a right to it is the question of whether there's an external impediment to my taking it. So, uh, of course, we don't mean, is there a literal impediment to my taking it? We mean, is there one of these artificial impediments to my taking it? The artificial impediment would be that I would know that if I took this person's thing, they would get me back. Or they would not, or they would fight me and not let me take it. But in the state of nature, I, neither of us can be sure who would win that fight is what he's saying. Someone just asked, so then it is an aspect of a commonwealth that there be an unequal distribution of right. Uh, that's complicated. We'll get to that. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's an aspect of the state of nature that there's an equal distribution of right. But the equal distribution of right is that everyone has a right to everything. <laughs> Right? It's not that we've divided up the right evenly between everyone. It's that everyone has a right to everything because, again, no one can reckon reliably on um, someone else being able to prevent them from taking their stuff. So, Professor, yeah. would that also imply that there's a, you could, could you say there's an equal insecurity? Yes, exactly, because the state of everyone having a right to everything is a bad state. <laughs> yeah. It's not a good state to be in. That's, uh, that's, in a sense, what makes the whole book work. But first he has to try to show that that would be the state of nature. Right? In, in Hobbes' state of nature, could you say that it's, like a, it's, it's a logical, right? It's not a historical process because he makes the inference from the passions. Yeah, I'm going to get to that in one second. But I mean, he, but he, uh, um, it's not supposed to be something we learned about empirically. Right. The whole content of this book, I mean, sometimes he'll make a digression and say, I don't know why I'm out of focus now, but well. Sometimes he'll make a digression and say, by the way, experience also teaches this, right? But that's a digression. This whole book is supposed to be science, which, as we know from before, means that everything is supposed to be a consequence of the definitions. So, yes. So whatever he says about the state of nature is supposed to be a consequence of the definition of right and just and what? Nature? never really defined that exactly. <laughs> um, okay, so someone asked another question. So artificial impediments are meant to establish right without the need for ad external impediments? Well, so artificial impediments are meant to limit right without the need for literal external impediments. Again, in the state of nature, so, and that's why to begin with, I said that this part of the book is about the origin of injustice. In the state of nature, everyone has a right or use 
for everything. So in the state of nature, everything is just. Right? Whatever I do, take your stuff, kill you, enslave you, whatever I do is just because I had a right to it. So what, um, what needs to be done to get out of the state of nature is not to give people more rights, but to take away rights. The problem with the state of nature is we have too much right. <laughs> that is, there's only justice everywhere and no injustice. Um, okay, and because in the state of nature, nothing can be unjust, he says those words, um, says that word for word in chapter 13, paragraph 13, in the state of nature, nothing can be unjust. Therefore, there is no property. So let me, um, boy, I should erase some of this. So in the state of nature, there's unlimited rights. Therefore, no injustice. And therefore, no property. Why? Because what is property? Well, um, What is proper to me is what I have a right to and no one else has a right to. It's either, a, sometimes it can be a thing, but um, in both Hobbes and Locke, and I guess also Rousteau and Wollstonecraft, um, you have to pay attention to this because many times they use property in a sense that um, really applies to powers or like um, to actions you can take, um, right? But so it's something I can have that no one else has a right to have or something I can do that no one else has a right to do. That's what property is. That's, and again, it comes from proper, which means like own. My, you know, is related to, to self, um, so, um, in a state of nature, there's no property because whatever I have, everyone else has a right to, or whatever I can do, everyone else has a right to prevent me from doing. Um, or you can also put it this way, that there's no stable or reliable property in the state of nature. I think sometimes he thinks of it one way and sometimes he thinks of it the other way and it might make a difference. So I just um, want to point out what the difference would be that um, Um, it is consequent also to the same condition that there be no property, no dominion, no mine and thine distinct, but only that be every man's that he can get, and for so long as he can keep it. Right? So he kind of changes his mind in the middle of that sentence. First he says, in the state of nature, no one has anything, there is no property, but at the end he says, people have only what they can get as long as they can keep it. So that makes it seem like, in a sense, there's property, except, of course, it doesn't do me any good to have property that only lasts until someone else takes it away. <laughs> um, okay, so, I mean, this is actually going to turn out to be really important and to be... 
um, at the root of the disagreement between Hobbes and Locke, whether there can be property in a state of nature. And Hobbes' position is no. So Hobbes' position is that property is all created by the commonwealth, is all created by the state. There, no one has property except insofar as the state gives it to them. Gives it to them in the sense of excluding everyone else's right from it. Right? Limiting everyone else's initially unlimited right by um, um, saying, no, you don't have a right to this. That's Abe's stuff. <laughs> so... Um, so, I mean, as we'll see, even though Hobbes uh, is not what you would normally think of under this name, uh, I mean, for example, he definitely favors free trade and, you know, like uh, uh, private inheritance and so on and so forth. He's basically a socialist, right? He thinks that all property derives from the state and the state that is the sovereign has the um, perfect right to redistribute it as, as they see fit. Someone just asked, so according to Hobbes, there's only property in a commonwealth. Yes, that's what I've been saying, only in a commonwealth. Because according to Hobbes, outside of a commonwealth, that is in the state of nature, there are unlimited rights. And therefore, there's no injustice. There's also... Um, no such thing as injury. That's that same word use. It, it, it has an R in it that turns up in certain places. <laughs> um, there's no such thing as injury. There's only, Hobbes makes a distinction between injury and damage, right? So what, you know, what we usually call injury, like someone, you know, cut me or something, that's what he would call damage. But injury means that someone violated my right. There is no injury in the state of nature, and therefore there is no property. There's, so to speak, nothing that I could sue someone for. Um, okay, did that help? Okay, and this leads to the state of nature being a state of war. So there's three reasons for the war that Hobbes gives. And the first one is the easiest to understand based on what we just said, is competition. By which he means that, you know, if there's anything that we can't both use, and there's lots of things like that, um, then um, we both have a right to it. And what that means is that um, we're both known to be in a position to fight for it. Right? Again, if it were known that in a fight one of us would lose then that would be an example of one of those artificial chains, right? It would be reliable. Like if, if I knew that in a fight between the two of us, you would win, um, then, and you said, um, look, this is mine and I'm excluding you from it, then I would lose my right because now there would be an artificial impediment. Right? That is, I wouldn't want to take that thing because I would know that you could beat me. But the fact that that's never the case in the state of nature, according to Hobbes, now whether he's really proved that is another question, but the fact that, that, that according to Hobbes, that's never the case in the state of nature means that whatever the, um, thing we both might want, it's known to both of us that the other one wouldn't be unreasonable to fight us over it. And as Hobbes says, um, uh, the state of war doesn't consist just in, it doesn't, this, we're not in a state of war only 
when we're actually fighting a battle with each other. Um, this is chapter 13, section or paragraph 8, um, where he says that the state of war consists as long as the will to contend by battle is sufficiently known. I mean, this makes sense when you think of what we normally call wars, right? Like, even if there's no fighting going on right now, if both sides know that there's no peace and expect the other side to fight as, you know, to fight them as soon as they move their forces somewhere else, then it's still a state of war. So Hobbes is saying in the state of nature, that's always the case because of competition, right? So if, in, for every example of something that two people both want, but they can't both have, there is a known will to contend by battle for it. So this is a state of a cause of a state of war, and that in itself is enough for there to be a constant state of war in the state of nature. However, um, this is in a sense a relatively weak cause of war in the sense that there only will actually be battles when there's something that we both really want and we think it's worth risking losing the battle in order to get it. So, um, I mean, there aren't going to be battles, um, number one, there aren't going to be battles over trivial things for this reason. And number two, there's going to be a limit to what we'll fight over. It's only going to be things we really want. So if I already have as much as I need of something, I'm not going to keep fighting. But then the second cause of war comes in which is what Hobbes calls diffidence. That is basically fear, suspicion. Um, even if there isn't something we're competing over right now, if I see you getting stronger, I have to be afraid that next time it comes down to competition, you're going to beat me. And the only way I can allay that anxiety is by preemptive attack, which he calls anticipation. Right? When he says anticipation, he means preemptive attack. Um, so this is a secondary cause of war, right? Like this wouldn't come up at all if, there, if it weren't for competition. It's because I know that I might want or need, maybe desperately need something that you also want or need, um, that I start to get worried that you're getting too strong. And I have to attack you before that happens, not afterwards. Right. So although this is a secondary cause of war, it's much stronger because there's no limit to how much power I might need to feel secure. So I'm always going to keep fighting you, even if I have plenty of stuff already like gathered up. Um, I'm still afraid that tomorrow you're going to get stronger and come and take it back. And so I have to keep fighting. So, um, so this cause of war makes this state of war that, it, that we find in the state of nature worse, more violent, more unlimited. Someone said, sums up current geopolitics well. Well, it sums up Hobbes' view of geopolitics exactly, <laughs> as I'll say in a moment. Um, so, but nevertheless... Um, even with these two put together, you might think there wouldn't be that much actual fighting in the state of nature. And I think this is important because I'm not sure. It can seem like Hobb doesn't notice what I'm about to say, but I feel like he must notice it and that that's why the third cause is so important. And what, the, what he might or might not notice is that given the 
precariousness of possession in the state of nature, um, no one is going to have much that's worth fighting over. Um, um, right? Like, I just talked about how I was gathering up a whole bunch of stuff, but it doesn't make sense to do that in the state of nature. Right? As Hobbes says, it doesn't make sense to work at planting a field when I know that um, everyone around me is going to gang up on me and come take all the produce. So I'm not going to do that. So I'm just going to, what am I going to eat? Whatever I can find and immediately put in my mouth before someone else can take it. So therefore, I'm not going to have a lot of stuff on me that's worth taking. And, and I'm not going to have a lot of power that I've built up either. And so these two reasons aren't going to give people a lot of reason to fight me. So it seems like... Therefore, maybe this third reason, which is glory, is especially important. So Hobbes defines glory in chapter 6. I'm not sure. I don't even remember if I assigned this part or not. He defines glory in chapter 6, section 39 on page 31. Okay. Joy arising from imagination of a man's own power and ability is that exaltation of the mind which is called glorying. Um, right, so glory just by itself, I mean, it might not see, it might not be clear why this is a cause of war. It just means taking joy in the fact that I have power and ability. Why does that lead to war? Well, if you look in chapter 13, section 5, Chapter 14, section 5. Mm. No. Oh, yeah. Page 70. Oh, I'm not on the wrong page. Yeah, I guess I should start on page 75, actually. For every man looketh that his companion should value him. At the same rate he sets upon himself, and upon all signs of contempt or undervaluing, naturally endeavors as far as he dares, which amongst them that have no common power to keep them in quiet is far enough to make them destroy each other, to extort a greater value from his contemners by damage and from others by the example. Right? So the reason glory causes war is that um, I take joy in the great value I set on myself. Now I notice that you put less value on me than I do. Um... And that makes me angry. <laughs> and so I try to make sure that um, you come to agree with my assessment of my power and ability. How can I do that? By um, attacking you. Oh, what did you want to read? Someone want me to read something again? The thing about... Oh, okay. I, after you kept talking. Okay, sorry. Um, 
I'm sorry, it's hard to keep track of the chat and everything at the same time. Um, um, right, so how can I make you acknowledge my power and ability by showing you that I'm stronger than you? <laughs> That's the only way, basically, at least in the state of nature. So I have to fight you. And that will make you put a, set a higher value on me and stop contemning me. And it will also make everyone else who notice what happened put a higher value on me. Um, so, um, so this third cause gets fighting started even when there isn't that much to fight over. Right, as as Hobbes says, for 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 this third cause, people fight over a look or a wrong word, or you know any kind of trivial thing, um, and they can't. They feel they can't afford to let that go unpunished because that would be to confirm everyone's opinion that they don't have that much power and ability. Um, now, I mean, it's not 100% clear why in the state of nature I would care so much what others' opinion of me is. Um, you might think that um, I would, as I rate my own power and ability higher than everyone else's, I would also rate my own opinion higher than everyone else's, and I wouldn't care what they thought. Um, so, I, and I'm not sure what Hobbes' answer to that is. Um, but, uh, but in any case, if we grant him that this is that this will rise to such importance in my consciousness in the state of nature, then we can see that this this state of war will be in constant danger of breaking out at every time. Um, so it's not just technically a state of war; it will be a miserable situation, nasty, brutish, and short. In the famous phrase. Right. Um, I think also that Locke and especially Rousseau are going to disagree with Hobbes about whether this motive of glory is important in a state of nature. So that's also something to keep track of. But okay, so anyway, according to Hobbes, there's therefore there's a constant war of all against all. And it's technically a constant state of war because everyone is known to be disposed to fight each other in certain situations. But it's not just that. It's not a cold war. It's a war that's going to constantly cause actual violence. Or as Haas puts it, it exposes everyone to continual fear of violent death. So that's one of the bad things about the state of nature. <laughs> um, I guess I'm going to erase all of this and write the bad things about the state of nature. The bad things about the state of nature are the fear of violent death. So that's like a negative reason to leave the state of nature. Um, but also the state of nature leaves certain desires that we have unachievable. Um, so I would summarize it this way. In the state of nature, we can't have nice stuff. Or as Hobbes puts it, um, going back to chapter 13, section 9, on page 76, um, basically what we don't have in the state of nature is civilization, right? 
there's no culture of the earth, no navigation, nor use of commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments of moving and removing such things as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society. And then he says, which is worst of all, the fear, continual fear of violent death. So the continual fear of violent death, I guess that's worst of all. I mean, at least Hobbes certainly, but this is worth asking about, certainly always assumes that the worst thing that could happen is that you die. Why is that not, maybe not obvious? Well, I mean, for one thing, everyone dies. <laughs> right? It's not like there's anything you can do so you won't die. That's why he had to put in continual fear of violent death, right? Um, so anyway, but so Hobbes thinks, in any case, Hobbes thinks that's the worst thing, but this is pretty bad, that we can't have civilization. Um, these are the things that are, as he calls them a little bit later in the chapter, the things that are necessary to commodious living. Um, and the assumption is that without those things, we'd be very unhappy. That is that what Hobbes and others call savages, um, at least savages who are really in the state of nature, um, must necessarily be very unhappy compared to civilized people. Hobbes just takes it for granted that you'll agree with that, I think. It's just obvious that people who don't have books and farming and navigation and commodious buildings and whatever are much less happy than people who have them. Um, Rousseau is going to challenge that in a big way. <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, are there questions about that so far? Professor, he, um, he mentions a couple of times, uh, I don't know if there's a distinction between worth and value in the way he uses it during his time. Is there one? Well, that's a good question. I don't know either. Okay. <laughs> that's uh, that's a good question, and I don't know. Uh, yeah, I just don't know if to take them as interchangeable or if, um, you know, it meant something specific to what he was talking about during his time. If not, that's, that's fine. We can talk about it some other time. Yeah, I know. No, I mean, that is a good question, right? They're, I mean, they both correspond in German to Wert. Uh, but uh, um, we nowadays don't use them entirely interchangeably in English, so it would be hard for me to say what the difference is. And, yeah, and I'm not sure. Also, I yeah, and Hobbes will be thinking, of course, not about what the German equivalent is, but what the Latin equivalent is, which is what? Something from Fale, I guess, but I'm not even sure what the word is. All right, so that's a good question, but I don't know the answer. Okay, but I think uh, the question um, you asked earlier about, like, is this empirical or logical? So one answer I gave to is, this is supposed to be logical. It's supposed to be a priori. Oops, what's going on? Uh -oh. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, but I'm having trouble. I can't even... Um, 
Oh, this is bad. I might have to reboot. Nothing's responding at all. I think there's something short of that that I can do. Oh, wait. Oh. Is it back? Yes, it's back. Still no. Okay, I do not know what happened there. I hope it won't happen again. All right. Um, sorry, what was I going to say? Oh, so one answer is, well, it's supposed to be logical. That is, it's supposed to be um, things that are true by definition. It's supposed to be a, a list of things that are true by definition. Um, but uh, another answer to it is that um, you could mean the question this way. Does Hobbes think there actually is a state of nature or has been ever a state of nature? Or is this just an abstraction? So um, Hobbes actually addresses that question. And he says um, that he doesn't think there's ever been a state of nature everywhere over the whole earth. Now, uh, why he doesn't think that, um, or why at least he has to say he doesn't think that, is probably because he's worried about the Genesis story and worried about someone saying, you know, uh, didn't uh, God furnish human beings with civil government when he created them or something like that? <laughs> um, but... Uh, in any case, he says he, he doesn't think there's ever been a worldwide state of nature, but he thinks two things. Number one, that there are some, quote, again, quote unquote, savages who are in the state of nature right now, for example, in North America, um, that they have no government, only families, which, although they're somewhat like commonwealths, are, are really... Uh, <laughs> in other ways quite different from commonwealths. Okay, hi. <laughs> um, so, but he also says, and this gets back to the question, who, the, um, oh, thank you, the person who uh, mentioned the current geopolitical situation, he also says that sovereigns of commonwealths are always in a state of nature with respect to each other. Right? There isn't a commonwealth of which they're all subjects. So there's no power over them to enforce any law, except God. But um, God is not a reliable deterrent, according to Hobbes. Right? When he mentions the fool who has said in his heart that there is no justice, he says, and the same fool has said in his heart that there is no God. <laughs> right? So whether or not you believe in Hobbes, and in, in God, <laughs> believe in Hobbes, whether or not you believe in God, and as I, as I mentioned before, there's certainly reason to think Hobbes doesn't, but whether or not you believe in God, that um, divine retribution is not a very reliable... Um, enforcer of laws because you don't know that the other person believes. <laughs> you can't rely on that. So, so the sovereigns are, are in a state of nature with respect to each other and therefore, according to Hobbes, international relations are always a state of war of all against all. Yes, yeah, someone, asked, someone asked, I'm confused, is Hobbes an atheist? So I said, as I said last time, Hobbes is, was notorious as an atheist. Everyone knew he was an atheist. What that means exactly, you might have to be careful about. It might just mean, you know, like people would call someone an atheist if that person wasn't a Christian. 
Um, so it might be consistent with him having a kind of metaphysical belief in God or something like that. But um, I'm inclined to think that they heard correctly and that he didn't believe in God. So as I said last time, that means we have to like be really careful all of the many times he talks about God in this book to try to figure out what part of what he's saying he believes. Um, all right. Um, right, so anyway, according to Hobbes, international relations are always a state of war of all against war. There isn't always actual battle, but he says you can tell that the states um, uh, have a known, or commonwealths have a known will to battle with each other. Just look at what they, how they fortify their borders, for example. Um, what he would say is going on, on, for example, the U.S.-Canada border, I'm not sure. Maybe the world is different now than it was then, or maybe he would deny that Canada is an independent commonwealth, or I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, so... So much, that's, that's everything about the state of nature and the right of nature and why, um, and the conclusion of all of it is that um, uh, if we're thinking straight, we won't desire the state of nature. meaning we won't desire this state of war of all against all. By the way, he says the international state of war of all against all is, doesn't lead to the same kind of misery because the sovereigns are able to protect their subjects to, and thereby allowing them to escape the constant fear of violent death and start building civilization. There may be other differences between that state of nature, between the sovereigns, which is the only one we're really sure exists, and the, and the state of nature between individuals, which all the proofs here are built on. So that's also something to worry about. Um, but, okay, so in any case, we all want to leave the state of nature if we think straight. We all desire... There's something we all desire in common, and as I was saying before, the something we all desire in common is peace. Um, right, like so on page 100. There's got to be a better way to do this. Oops, and now I've lost this camera too. Um. Oops. Oops. Sorry for the many technical problems this time. And therefore, so long a man is in the condition of mere nature, which is a condition of war, as private appetite is the measure of good and evil. Wait, sorry, is that really? I'm in trouble with the sentence now. Okay, but I, I don't understand the sentence very well. But okay, and therefore, as long as a man is in the condition of mere nature, which is a condition of war, as private appetite is the measure of good and evil, right? That's what we said before. Good and e good means I desire it, and evil means I have an aversion to it. 
and consequently, this is where the syntax seems to fall apart, but and consequently all men agree on this, that peace is good. So whatever the structure of the sentence is, which is confusing me now, he's saying that um, in a state of nature, there's one thing that everyone desires, and therefore that everyone can agree to call good, and that is peace. Right? Everything else that someone desires, they desire for themselves and not for other people. But the one thing everyone desires for everyone is peace, because they, to get out of the constant state of war, there has to be peace for everyone. Right? So I can't desire peace just for me and not for you. That wouldn't be peace, because you would still be at war with me. Right, so someone asks, so in a state of nature, there will always exist a state of war. Yes, according to Hobbes, that's the claim. State of nature is, and he says you can prove it, it's by definition, <laughs> a state of nature will be a state of war. And since a state of war, at least this kind of state of war, between individuals, a state of war of all against all is um, the most miserable state you can imagine, um, you can't have any of the means of commodious living and you're constantly in fear of violent death. Um, therefore, everyone in a state of nature wants to be out of the state of nature. And again, right, it's not like everyone wants, everyone in the state of nature wants water, let's say. That means, you know, A wants water for A and B wants water for B and C wants water for C. So in a sense, they all agree that they want water, but they don't really agree on what is good to happen. But peace is different, right? I, again, I can't want peace for myself and not for everyone else. If only I have peace, that's not peace because everyone else is still at war with me. So peace is the thing that I have to want for everyone. That everyone has to want for everyone. Well, have to want, I mean, this is actually a little bit confusing, and this gets back to the question that a couple people, I think one of them was Samantha, and maybe someone else asked last time about um, what, what about when you desire self-destructive things like drugs or something? Um, is that good? You right to call that good, or are you wrong to call that good? Um, So Hobbes actually, in chapter 15, um, section 34, mentions drunkenness, which, you know, has to do with drugs, right? Um, as an example of using self-destructive use of drugs. He mentions drunkenness as something which is against a law of nature. It's not one of the political laws of nature, but it's still a law of nature because it's... Um, since everyone desires their own self-preservation, everyone should desire not to avoid drunkenness. I guess he means excessive drunkenness, or I don't know if he literally means any drunkenness at all. But in any case, um, um, so there's the example right there. You think you want it, but it's against the law of nature, meaning you don't really want it, or you shouldn't want it, or you wouldn't want it if you were reasonable, or... I'm not sure exactly what to say about that, actually, or therefore about the other laws of nature. But at least this much is, is, is true according to Hobbes. If you think straight, if you're reasonable in a state of nature, you will want peace. And therefore, I guess you could say at least that it's rationally good. It's demonstrably good. So, uh, oh, someone said drunkenness becomes an impediment. Yeah, but of course, that wouldn't be an external impediment. That would be an internal impediment, um, according to Hobbes. Um, so it would be a limit on your power, not on your liberty. That obviously is not how many philosophers think about 
about drunkenness and things like that. They, they do think it makes you unfree, but that's not the way Hobbes thinks about it. Um, okay. Um, so the laws of nature, so I'm going to erase the state of nature and put up the laws of nature. The laws of nature tell you what to do to get peace. And so they tell you what is absolutely good. Right? I mean, if you're in a state of nature, you should want to leave it. And if you're not in a state of nature, you shouldn't want to go back to it. So the laws of nature always tell everyone what is absolutely good. Um, Hobbes says later on that, um, to, I guess at the end of chapter, towards the end of chapter 14, it's interesting that he only says this after he's listed all the laws. He says, strictly speaking, these are not really laws exactly. Um, they're really uh, good advice, precepts. Or counsel. That is, they take the you know they all implicitly take the form. If you fear violent death and you want nice stuff, then you should try the, observing the following rules. Um. And so what are the, the nature of these rules that the law of nature or the precepts of nature advise you to adopt are the means by which peace could be achieved. If everyone would follow these rules, we could have peace, basically. Um, or as he puts it, on um, page 78, chapter 14, paragraph 4, no, chapter 13, paragraph 14. Right. So what makes us want to leave the state of nature are fear of death and desire of such things that are necessary to commodious living. What makes us want to leave the state of nature are passions, desires, and aversions, um, and a hope by their industry to obtain them. But um, what is going to enable us to attain that desire is reason, and reason is going to, reason suggesteth convenient articles of peace upon which men may be drawn to agreement. Oops, I think the ment is off the page. Right, so the laws of nature, well, actually, the first law of nature is, um, The first law of nature, seek peace, um, is just um, the motivation I've just been giving for the rest of them. I guess you could say that this is something that reason suggests in the sense that the passions get us only aversion to violent death and desire for nice things, and reason says, oh, you want peace. <laughs> That's what you're talking about, peace, right? So that's the first law, you should desire peace. Um, 
and uh, Hobbes calls it the first and fundamental law. It's fundamental because all the other laws follow from this first law. All the other laws are the articles of peace that reason suggests. I hope that didn't just go out of focus. No, it didn't. Okay. And so the second law is the first, and I guess you could also say the fundamental article of peace, right? By article of peace, we mean, right, like in a, a peace treaty consists of articles of the peace, right? Like this is what we're agreeing on in order to end the war. So that's what the laws of nature are, so to speak. They're the treaty that we want to get everyone to sign on to. Although, again, we haven't explained how to do that. That's going to be explained in book two. But in book one, it's just trying to explain what are what is the treaty we want everyone to sign on to. Um, And the second, so it's very long. I'm not going to write the whole thing up here, but we need to be. We need a mutual laying down of rights. That is. Um, if other men, oh no, sorry, that man be willing when others are so too. Did I show this in the book? Do people find it have, uh, helpful when I show you the book or not? Yes? Okay, well, I'll show it in the book then. It obviously makes things take longer, but maybe that's not a bad thing either. All right. Right, so this is the second law of nature. That a man be willing, when others are so too, as far forth as for peace and defense of himself he shall think it necessary, to lay down this right to all things, and be contented with so much liberty against other men as he would allow other men against himself. Right, so the law is um, allow others to limit your unlimited right. Well, someone else says not hard, not really. It's hard to see where you're reading from. I try to point at what I'm reading from. Is that not, maybe I should get a better pointer than my finger? I mean, it's okay. It's just, yeah, it's kind of hard to narrow in. Um, but like just having the page numbers and flipping to it myself is also good. All right. So, I don't know. All right. Yeah, I mean, it is like, um, I feel like reading something out loud when you don't have the text in front of you is hard to follow. That's one of the reasons I want to do it. Yeah, that's true, especially with the archaic language. Yeah, the archaic language and the archaic style, right? It was still... Um, in English, as it, as it still is in academic German, it was still considered good style to make your sentence really complicated. <laughs> Whereas that's now considered bad style in English, but you know, these things change. Right, so anyway, um, right, so the second law says I should um, lay down whatever rights I want other people to lay down against me. And this, um, this is certainly a fundamental way of attaining peace. 
right? That is, if we can all agree to limit our own rights until they don't conflict anymore, then we can put an end to the state of war. And how could we possibly reach that agreement? Well, we each have to be satisfied that we're getting what we pay for, basically, right? So, I mean, we have to be satisfied that we're not giving up all our rights and letting everyone else keep theirs, but that we're giving up the exact rights we want them to also give up, and vice versa. So, so this certainly, I mean, if you can get this to happen, um, certainly looks like a way that you might achieve peace. It's worth noticing right away um, that there would be another way of achieving what the, the first law um, requires, which would be if I could be strong enough to impose peace on everyone else. Right? Like, if I could make everyone else stop fighting each other, um, then and stop fighting me, then I wouldn't be afraid of violent death anymore, and we could start building civilization. Um, now, I mean, the thing about um, humans being equal in a state of nature shows that that second path can't be followed in that state of nature that Hobbes imagines of war of all individuals, or at least families, against each other. Um, um, right? Because the whole point is no one's strong enough to overpower everyone else. But in the state of nature between sovereigns, so here's another difference, maybe one of them can be much more powerful than the others. Right? Maybe one of them can impose its peace on the whole world, or at least on all its surroundings, by conquering everyone. Um, um, so um, Hobbes does think that that's a way that you can achieve or at least grow a commonwealth. It's called Commonwealth by Acquisition. Right? If I'm strong enough to subdue everyone else, but I now is going to have to be not an individual, but a, a commonwealth, basically. He doesn't make that clear when he talks about commonwealth by acquisition, but I think that's true. So um, if I am strong enough to, to put everyone else in the position where they either have to agree to obey me or I'm going to kill them, <laughs> then um, I can get them in that way to agree to be peaceful with each other and towards me without laying down my own rights. Oh, here's a question. Must all these laws of nature simultaneously happen in order to achieve peace? Well, they're all individually enough. I think uh, it's some. I think it's somewhere between those. I think the first, the first one, obviously, is necessary to achieve peace. You have to seek peace. <laughs> um, the second one, I think, is necessary, except for the alternative that I was just talking about. The others, I think, Hobbes thinks that for the peace to be perfect and lasting, they all have to be perfectly obeyed by everyone. That at least by all the subjects of the commonwealth, not by the sovereign who remains in a state of nature. We'll learn more about that next time. So, um, um, but uh, in practice, of course, they're never completely obeyed by everyone. Um, but that's enough to have some kind of um, commonwealth. So I think that's the best answer I can give for now. I think we'll see going forward that there is an issue in Hobbes about whether there ever is a commonwealth of the kind he imagines, 
or whether all the things that we think of as commonwealths or states are actually so imperfect by his, his standards that they really count as people still in a state of war. <laughs> um, all right. Um, okay, so there's just, um, let's see, I definitely want to, Um, I will. I wanted to get to discuss to discussing all the other laws, but that's completely unrealistic. In fact, I knew in advance that would be unrealistic. Um, I do want to at least get to discussing the third law, and I might mention the thirteenth, which is really important. I think. Um, but uh, let me finish talking about the second law very briefly first. Um, um, so there's just, I think there's several things to note about this. First of all, no one's getting any new rights out of this mutual laying down of rights, right? No one could get any new rights because before, when we were a state of nature, everyone had an unlimited right. So it only consists of laying down rights. And initially, moreover, everyone must lay down the same rights. So this is going to raise a problem for Hobbes to explain why if in the foundation, in, in a state of nature, everyone is equal, has equal rights. And at the foundation of a commonwealth, everyone still has equal rights because they all lay down the same rights. So how does inequality of rights come to arise in a commonwealth? What's the origin of inequality? So, um, yeah, actually, maybe I'll mention the 13th law right here. The 13th law of nature, which is in chapter 15, section 26, says that um, if there are things such that... Um, they can't be used in common, and there isn't enough of them to be equally, or and, and they can't be equally divided among everyone, right? So things that have to go to someone and therefore not go to everyone else, um, they have to be distributed by lot. Now that makes it sound like we're gonna roll dice or something, which, by the way, I think he may be thinking of this. Literally, the Bible describes the different parts of the land of Canaan being given out to the tribes by lot before they entered the land, right? But but he's but as you know, when he says more about this, you'll rea you, can, you realize that he's not literally thinking about throwing dice or something. He says there's two um, ways this works out. One is when possession, possession is given to the first person who acquires something. Or when, sorry, I guess I say property is given to the first possessor. Right, so like at the foundation of the commonwealth, if I go out and claim some piece of land and start working on it, then, then it becomes mine. And not everyone else's. So there's inequality. I mean, even if everyone has the same amount of land, there's already the beginning of inequality. My land might be better. Um, I might decide to do something different with my land than you do. Might produce different things and I might use them to buy something from you and I might get richer than you, etc. right? So, but number two, he says the other way lot works out is in a law of primogeniture when um, an entire uh, um, right passes to the first born offspring of the person who had it before. Right, and he's calling that distribution by lot because it's by chance that I happen to be the oldest, so to speak. <laughs> um, uh, it's whoever rolled the highest number on the dice was born first, so to speak. And they get 
So, I mean, this doesn't have to be done with inheriting land, but, but presumably it has to be done with inheriting offices, for example. Either the offers of the sovereignty, if that's heritable, or um, uh, offices of nobility, if those are created. So there again is a way that inequality can be created, um, or at least can be amplified, right? In one generation, I have this right, and in the next generation, one of my children has the right and the others don't. And apparently, Hobbes traces all inequality in the Commonwealth to the, all, all legitimate inequality in the Commonwealth to the operation of that one law. <laughs> I think that's the case. Okay, so the last thing to mention I may have to keep talking about this next time. The last thing to mention is that, that rights are not, of course, the kind of thing you can literally lay down or transfer. Right? A right means there is no impediment to my doing something. That there's no impediment to my doing, external impediment to my doing something is not something I can give to you or put down on the ground or anything like that. Okay? And uh, I didn't talk about this, but I, I hope you may have noticed in the reading that Law Hobbes is actually very down on metaphors. Well, maybe I did mention this when I talked about whether it's a metaphor that the Commonwealth is a living thing. Um, um, right? He makes fun of scholastics for saying things like grace is infused. But this seems no better. A right is transferred, a right is laid down. What kind of talk is that? So Hobbes does have an answer. I mean, that is, he does have an answer to how this is done. He doesn't have an answer that I understand to why he's using a metaphor for it when he war after he warned us about metaphors. But the answer is, how do I do it? Well, um, I do it by giving words or other voluntary signs. So I can't literally lay down the right, but I can say something that has the effect that I no longer have the right. And in addition, if I want, I can give it to someone else. I can say something such that I no longer have the right and someone else does. So the question is, however, how can those signs, like saying things, change my right? Again, to change my right means to change what I have a liberty to do or forbear. That is, it means to, to, to lay down my right means to create an impediment, an external impediment. Um, and, you know, um, of course, if it were my will not to exercise the right, then you could say I'd given it up, right? Because that would mean at the end of my deliberations, I've decided not to exercise it. I mean, it's, it, it's, it'd still be a weird way of giving it up, right? I mean, there, isn't, there still isn't really an impediment, or not an external one anyway. Um, but, uh, but, of course, when I give the sign, all that I've ended my de deliberation over is whether to give the sign, right? Like whether to say, I hereby give this to you. That's the kind of sign we're talking about. How can those words constrain my will to exercise this right later on? And the answer is that they can't. <laughs> right? So, oh, I'm out of time, so I'm not going to read this in the book, but I'll just read this one more sentence, and then I will talk about this more on Thursday, I guess. Right? Hobbes says, they have their strength not from their own nature, 
For nothing is more easily broken than a man's words, but from fear of some evil consequence upon the rupture. So signs can result in my right changing if the signs create the reliable, that is making the signs and having people hear them and understand them creates the reliable expectation that I'll be punished if I, if I try to exercise this right afterwards. So when I say, I give you this thing, the way that eliminates my right to the thing is that I know that if you and witnesses heard me say that, then um, I can reliably expect that if I come and try to take back the thing tomorrow, I'll be punished. So this won't happen in a state of nature, but it's a law of nature because it says, if you want to be out of the state of nature, there has to be a way for words to have this effect. Okay. Um, that's basically the third law, but like I said, I will have to talk about that next time. So I'll see you then. Bye.